No, oh, before I forget, man, I was wondering if you could help me with something. And the cashier, an acne red old kid who looked to be in his late teens or early 20s, looked up from shoving the bag of potato chips, two sodas, and a pack of Lucky Strikes into a plastic bag. For a moment, he just stood there, seemingly frozen in mid action, and then he finally answered, Yeah, what's up, man? I let out a barely perceptible sigh. I had been half afraid that I would be told to take a long walk off a short pier, to put it politely. Feeling relieved, I reached into my back pocket for what was there. You see, I seemed to have, well, sort of gotten lost out here. I decided to take a late night drive and ended up getting turned around on all these two lane back roads. I unfolded the map and set it on the counter so that he and I could both see it before continuing. So I was hoping that you could point out on here roughly where we are, and more importantly, the way to get back to the main road. There was another long stretch of silence and then the kid began to laugh, softly at first and then louder. Dude, a paper map. He managed out between wheezes. Are you for real? What year do you think this is? 1993? And for my part, I simply let out a resigned sigh. I had had a bad feeling that I would be getting this sort of reaction from someone his age and it looked like I had been proven correct. Can't say I didn't see it coming. He wiped tears from the corners of his eyes and looked at me. Seriously bro, don't you have a GPS in your car or something? He asked. Immediately, I hooked a thumb over my shoulder, pointing at the glass entry door at the beige sedan sitting at the gas pumps. And not in a Honda Accord from 1979, I replied simply. As he looked behind me out the door, I could see that he wanted to make another quip, and probably something about how I should buy a newer car or something. Thankfully though, he kept it to himself. Instead, he leaned over the map and still chuckling softly to himself, began looking at it. A few moments later, he snapped his fingers. Ha, I still got it, he said proudly, and then pushed his finger down near the middle of the map and looked up at me. We're right about here, roughly six or seven miles outside of Placer. He leaned over the counter to see as he drew his finger away. Here? He nodded, and I pulled a pen out of my pocket, circling the area as a reminder once I left, and then examined the map further. Okay, so it seems that I could take more than a few roads to get back to Interstate 5, right? And the kid nodded again, clearly already bored with the unusual interaction by the slightly annoyed look which had begun to cross his face. Sure, he said simply, and then placed my bag items on top of the map. And that'll be $14.50 for this and $28.50 for the gas. I reached into my pocket and pulled my wallet out, withdrawing three twenties and handing them to him. The register let out its trademark ding as it shot open, and he placed the bills in it before pulling out and handing me my change. Placing it and my wallet back into my pocket, I picked up the bag and folded the map back up. Thanks for the help, I said as I turned to head out the door. Yeah, no problem. I heard him mutter at me as I crossed to the front door and pushed it open. A small bell hung from the inside handle jangled as I stepped outside and the door swung shut behind me. The sounds of the refrigerators humming and the fluorescent lights softly buzzing was replaced by those of a summertime forest at night. Crickets and cicadas buzzed loudly in the grass around this door, almost overwhelming the buzzing sound of the lights over the palms. The sound of an owl hooting loudly echoed through the trees followed by the loud call of what had to have been an owl. I inhaled the clean air before heading down the steps for my car. Pulling open the driver's door, I took one last look around before dropping into the driver's seat. So, did you find out where we are? Asked a voice from my passenger seat. For a split second, a wave of confusion and panic swept over me, and I spun in my seat. It was immediately replaced by a wave of embarrassment amplified as my friend began to let out a deep laugh. Dude, were you in there that long that you forgot that I was out here waiting for you? Not wanting to admit that I had done just that, I shook my head. No bro, not that, just dealing with the kid in there was a major headache. He nodded sympathetically. And Craig was one of my close friends. 
Ever since we had met each other, we had immediately clicked, and had stuck with each other from that point on. And one thing that we both loved to do was take late night drives to nowhere, simply driving around with no destination in mind, listening to the radio and occasionally sharing a joint one of us would buy. This was the first time that we had ever gotten lost though. I reached into the bag, pulling out the bottle of Mr. Pibb and handing it to him. Here, I said simply, before pulling the lucky strikes out and chucking the rest into the back seat. Pulling the key from my pocket, I slid it into the ignition and turned it. The car's a buzzer sounding as the dash lights came on. A moment later, the inline four quietly rumbled to life with its traditional burble. Tearing open the packaging, I pulled a cigarette from the pack and stuck it into the corner of my mouth before reaching to push in the car's cigarette lighter. As I did, I shot a glance back towards the store, and I froze. A small shiver shot down my spine as I realized the kid was standing at the door and staring out at us. What was he doing? Craig caught my gaze and turned to look himself. Dude, what is his problem? I shook my head as the lighter popped back out, signaling that it was ready to use. I pushed the glowing red coil against the tip of the smoke for a moment until it was lit, and then I placed it back into its slot. I pulled it from my lips and exhaled a cloud of smoke before answering, feeling more than a bit unnerved. I don't know man, but honestly, that's more than a bit creepy. I shot one last glance. The kid hadn't even blinked once, he was just staring off with an off-putting intensity out the glass. Come on, let's get out of here, Craig said, echoing the thoughts swimming through my mind. I put the car into first gear and eased off the clutch the car beginning to roll forward. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him turn and shoot the bird at the kid as we slid off from under the lights into the dark. Prick, I heard a mumble. I turned the car left and began heading back the way that we came. Well, the good thing is, yeah, I did find out where we are. I pulled the map from my pocket and handed it to my friend. I heard him fumbling for a moment and then a small flashlight clicked on as he aimed it at the map. Dude, how did we make it almost as far east as Placer? He asked with a slightly astonished tone. A longer drive than normal, I guess, I answered, rolling down my window to flick the ashes from my smoke out. I shot a glance at the analog clock on the dashboard. 2.45, it read. I let out a small sigh. Ah, great. Vanessa is likely worrying up a storm about us right now. And me especially. Ever since we had started dating five years ago, my girlfriend had always been rather apprehensive about my habit of taking long late night drives when I couldn't sleep. She always feared that I would get into an accident either with another car, wrap my Honda around a tree, or hit an animal. Most of the time, I would come home to find her sitting up and waiting for me. Worry clearly etched into her beautiful sapphire eyes. I bit my lips slightly. Hey, do you think I should text Vanessa and let her know that we're okay? I asked Craig. I heard him let out a snort. Honestly, bro, no. I know the woman loves you to death and I'm happy that you care so much. But she's got to learn you know what you're doing. Plus, you do need your space. It's not healthy how much time you two spend together. I flicked the remnants of the cigarette out the window and let out a snore to my own. It's called being in love, dude, and you should try it sometime. I joked, causing him to let out a laugh. <laughs> nah, thanks, I enjoy being single too much. Shaking my head, I stared out the windshield as the headlights guided her way. I felt a slight sense of unease creep up on me as I watched the two-lane road stretch out before us. The moon in the sky almost completely blocked by the trees over our heads. I hadn't seen another car on the road for two hours at least. Well, what do you expect, Derek? You drove out into the boonies, there's only ghost towns out here. Why don't you try driving all the way to Idaho next time? Shaking my thoughts away, I fumbled in the center console for a moment before pulling out a mixtape. A bit of music would help me feel better. I pushed it into the car's cassette player and hit play. A moment later, the pounding bass and synths of Dance with the Deads 
that house began blasting from the speakers. Craig let out a whoop of excitement. Dude, yes, that's the kind of tunes we need for a drive like this. He rolled down the passenger window, sticking his head out the window to whoop and holler into the night. I shook my head, unable to keep from grinning at his antics. Friggin' goofball. The playful mood helped to settle my mind and I felt myself relax into the seat, the tension flowing out of my body and out the window. For a few minutes, that's how things went, the road stretching out ahead of us and then disappearing into the blackness behind us, the music blasting off from the radio and the soft roar of the engine in the background. I shot another look at the backlit clock. Now it read at 5 minutes to 3, and we should be at the highway in a minute. The thought released the last wisps of tension in my body and fumbled into the back seat for the bag, catching it with the tips of my fingers. I pulled my bottle of soda from it and holding the bottle to the steering wheel, I cracked the cap. I lifted it to my lips and took a swig, taking my eyes off the road for a split second to tilt my head back. I looked back at the road and nearly spit it all out under the windshield, and the second that I had stopped looking, a figure had stepped out onto the road. Watch out! Jamming my feet on the brake and clutch as hard as I could. The rear wheels of the car locked up and the ear-piercing sound of squealing tires filled the cabin. To my horror, the tail end of the car began sliding out. No, 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 no. For a few seconds, the world around us became a blur of shapes and colors and I feared at any moment that we would smash into a tree or begin rolling. Thankfully, the car finally came to a stop with a screech of protest from the suspension. We were facing back the way that we had come. I could tell from the black lines on the road which had once been the rubber of my tires. I gripped the steering wheel with almost a death grip, my heart furiously pounding in my chest. My breast came in short, ragged gasps. There was no movement in the car for a few seconds before Craig reached forward and snapped the music off. Dude, what was that? He shouted at me, his face looking as pale as mine must be. I didn't say a word to him. Instead, I pulled up on the handbrake, ripped off my seatbelt, and practically kicked the door open. Stepping out onto the pavement, I stepped to the front of the car on unsteady legs until I was squarely in between the headlight beams. I looked around, first at the road ahead, then at the forest on either side. There was nothing there. What the? I turned and looked behind me over the roof of the car. The red glow of the taillights illuminated a few feet ahead, but beyond that, nothing but blackness. I turned again, looking out at the darkness beyond the branches. No movement disturbed the bushes and branches, and aside from the quiet hum of the car's engine, it was silent. I shook my head. Did, did I just imagine things? I shook it again. No, I know for a fact that I didn't hallucinate. There was someone there. The sound of the car door opening made me turn. Seeing Craig step out of the car, leaving the door open, he immediately came over to me. You have exactly 20 seconds to explain to me what the heck just happened before I lose it, bro, he exclaimed. For a second, I fought to find my voice and then I answered. Someone, dude, I'm not crazy. Somebody stepped out of the woods and out of the road. It looked like a chick. I thought that I was going to hit her. I realized that I had been holding in a breath and I let it out, trying desperately to get myself to relax. Craig gave me a confused look. Are you serious, man? I nodded. He pulled the flashlight that he had used to look at the map from his pocket and flicked it on, aiming it first at the tree line on one side of the road and then the other. After doing this a few times, he turned back to me. Well, whoever it was, they're not there anymore. His brow furrowed. But why would a chick be out here in the middle of nowhere? He muttered, more to himself than to me. I still answered. I don't know, man. It's freaking Josephine County. For as many good people live out here, there's also a bunch of weirdos. I heard my friend let out a snort of laughter in reply, but something had caught my attention a feeling which had slammed into me with all the weight of a Peterbilt. The feeling of eyes boring into the back of my skull. 
I spun around, looking back towards the car and seeing nothing there. But the feeling remained and I didn't like it one bit. Especially when the feeling came again. This time from the direction that I had just been facing a moment ago. Realization dawned on me and I felt a shiver shoot up my spine, along with the flicker of fear. Oh crap, I whispered. Craig turned to look at me. What? he asked, seeing the look on my face. He repeated. What? I looked up at him, speaking with a bit of a weak voice. Let's get back in the car right now. He didn't argue, thankfully. He was already moving for the open passenger door and I matched his pace as the feeling of being watched intensified, as if someone were rapidly approaching from the woods. I broke first into a run and then a full-out sprint for the last 10 feet, tearing at the door handle and practically launching myself into the driver's seat. Slamming the door closed behind me, I jammed down on the door lock, seeing Craig do the same. He turned to me, his face hidden in the dark, but his voice giving a perfect mental image of it. What the heck was that man? The tone of it gave away the fact that he had felt, even for the briefest of moments, the same feeling of dread and fear that I had had. You remember those videos of people driving on empty roads in the middle of the night, only to have somebody step out into the road and get them to stop? I asked. A sharp intake of breath came from the passenger seat before he answered, finishing my thought. And then a bunch of people sprint out of the woods trying to ambush them. Oh, heck no. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Time to get out of here. I released the parking brake, pulling on my seatbelt and jamming the car into first gear. The tires chirped as I hit the gas and a moment later, we were accelerating away. As we did, the feeling of being watched rapidly fell away to nothing, and I allowed myself to let out a relieved sigh. We drove in silence for another few minutes before I finally spoke again. I think we're on the clear, man. Craig let out a soft laugh. Thank God for that. I nodded and then reached for the soda which had fallen, wedging itself by the parking brake. Snatching it up, I uncapped it and took another swig. The still cool liquid of feeling amazing going down my throat. Recapping and dropping it behind me into the back seat, I let out a laugh of my own. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer Craig, but I think after this, I may take a bit of a break from late night drives for a while. This just got under my skin too much. For a few moments longer than I thought, there was nothing. And then he answered. As much as that sucks, bro, I can understand. No problem at all. I thought that I could detect a small tone of sadness in his voice, along with something else that I couldn't place. But then I heard him sit up straight. Hey, Jake, he asked, a bit of a concerned tone now etched into it. Yeah? I heard him draw another breath. Shouldn't we be on the highway by now, or at least see the lights of passing cars? I hadn't been fully concentrating on anything except the next stretch of road in my headlights. But at his words, I jerked my head to look beyond them. He was right. The lights of cars and trucks flashing by on the freeway should be visible through the dark. I clearly remembered looking in my side view mirror as we had turned onto the road from the highway, seeing the ever-present white and red glows zipping by both ways at close to the same distance that we were now. That wasn't the case anymore. All I could see in front of us was darkness. Darkness in the woods on either side of the road. For a moment, I lifted my foot off the accelerator, letting the car slow down a little as my brain whirred. He's gotta be mistaken. I mean, I've gotta be mistaken. We just haven't gotten close enough yet to the highway. You know these old roads, Derek. They often end up longer than they first look. Feeling somewhat relieved by the thought, I said it out loud to Craig. He nodded, but I could tell that he wasn't completely convinced. And for that matter, as much as I repeated it mentally to myself, I couldn't completely convince myself either. It was as if seeing the woman step in the road had shaken me more than I had first thought. 
Pushing back down on the gas, I shifted into fourth gear and watched the speedometer flirt with 50 miles an hour. For a few minutes more, neither one of us saw anything as we drove in silence. And then Craig let out a cry. There, a light. For a moment, a surge of hope welled up inside me, and I craned over the steering wheel looking to see the highway. It was dashed as I saw it was only a streetlight, standing solitary guard on the side of the road like a sentry. Beneath it stood an old worn sign which seemed to have been shot as many times with both BB pellets and actual bullets. I slowed the car some as it came towards us so I could read it, and I felt a wave of confusion fall over me. Golden, two miles. What? Craig breathed out as he read the sign. It passed by us, the streetlight, momentarily bathing the interior of the car in light and showing the confused, worried look on his face. How did we end up by Golden? Golden is a ghost town, one which attracts visitors every year to check out these standing buildings. It was a mining town which had a population of a few hundred people. But once the prospects dried up in the early to mid 20th century, it became the ghost town that it is today. Its biggest claim to fame nowadays was being featured on Ghost Adventures a few years back. Craig repeated his question, but I wasn't able to answer them. My thoughts were racing inside my head. There's no freaking way, Golden is miles to the north of Placer. There are no roads connecting the two areas from what I saw on the map. Not to mention, we've been driving in a straight line since leaving the gas station. I honestly don't know, man. I finally answered, my voice conveying how rattled I truly was. In the car's dark interior, I saw him put his head in his hands. I fumbled for my pack of cigarettes, pulling another one out with a slightly unsteady fingers and pushing in the cigarette lighter. A moment later, the turnoff for the ghost town flashed by on the right. I saw the dark, hulking shape of the church's spire, rising out of the dark for a moment. And then it was behind us. The lighter popped out and I pressed it to the smoke, lighting it and putting it back. I decided that I needed to try and calm the rising tension that was filling the car's interior. Look, however we ended up here, man, the fact is, we can't be far now from the highway. So let's just keep our wits about us. Keep calm and then we get back to my place. You, me, and Vanessa can have a good laugh over this. Sound good? I heard my friend take a deep breath and then let it out in a whoosh. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a plan. He let out a soft laugh and I felt him pat my shoulder. Thanks, Derek. You are seriously a good friend. I'm glad that I've got you. I nodded and then realized that he may not have been able to see it in the dark. No problem, man, I said. I looked at the clock. 3 a.m. Only five minutes had passed since I last looked at it, and yet it felt like it had been more than 30. Time seems different when you're stressed. For a few minutes, there was only darkness, and then a light appeared in the distance. Hey, there we go, I exclaimed. I waited to see the sign for the on-ramp appear, and I felt a shiver shoot up my spine as the sign for Golden flew by again. That's what? Craig didn't say anything, but I felt him stiffen in the passenger seat, showing that he had seen it as well. As the street light and sign disappeared behind us, a feeling began to creep up on me. Another shiver shot up my spine as I realized that it was the same feeling that I had had when we had gotten out of the car. The feeling of eyes on me. My eyes shifted to the blur of trees on either side of the car, but I saw no one there. The turnoff for the ghost town approached again. I heard Craig and let out another deep breath. Derek, pull over please, he said simply. His voice was shaking and as much as I didn't want to stop, I did as he asked, pulling over just before the turnoff. He ripped his seatbelt off, shoving the door open and stepping out. I watched him stride to the front of the car and stand there for a minute. He seemed to start shaking for a bit, and I realized just how much this was getting to him. I unbuckled my seatbelt and reached for the door handle, 
when I glanced at the clock and froze. The clock was still showing at 3 a.m. The hands hadn't moved at all. A feeling of shock washed over me like a wave as it tapped with my fingers to see if it was merely stuck, but it refused to begin moving again. Okay, what the actual heck is going on? I whispered to myself. I reached into my pocket, fishing out my phone and turning on the screen. Like the clock, it too showed the time as 3 a.m. The feeling of being watched began to intensify, and I glanced at Craig standing in the dark before looking down, beginning to type out a text to Vanessa. Hey baby girl, just wanted to let you know that Craig and I are okay. We're trying to get back to the highway, but we've gotten a bit turned around out here. Do me a favor, and if I don't text you again in 15 minutes, text me back, okay? I love you. I replaced the phone in my pocket. I knew that I should have been more honest, but I was beginning to feel a little freaked out about the weird situation. I didn't want to worry her any more than necessary, as it would make me start to freak out worse. Pushing open the door, I got out and walked around, stopping near the front right headlight. Dude, are you alright? I asked him after a moment. He didn't answer, but happily he seemed to have stopped shaking. I repeated my question. When he didn't answer my second and third calls, I began to feel the new sensation creep up on me. A potent mixture of dread and fear. Craig, dude, you're creeping me out. Please say something. He finally turned to look at me and in the semi-glow of the headlights, I saw that his face had gone a bit pale. He raised a finger and pointed as saying only a single word. Look. My eyes followed where he had gestured, and I began to feel like somebody had dumped a bucket of ice water over my head. The cigarette dangling from my lips fell from my mouth to the ground. Standing about 50 feet away just inside the tree line was a figure. It was drenched in gloom, but with a gasp, I realized it was the same woman who had nearly caused me to wreck. Oh, screw me sideways, man. I swallowed, finding my voice. We should, um, we should get back in the car, Craig. He nodded almost immediately. Uh, I think you might be right. He answered, his voice wavering. Not taking our eyes off the figure, we slowly backed up until we reached our respective doors and climbed in. I didn't even bother putting my seatbelt back on. I just jammed the gear shifter into first and I floored it. Dirt and gravel kicked out behind us and the car shot forward onto the road. This time I didn't let up on the gas. I kept my foot down hard, the engine beginning to roar as I shifted into third and fourth. The speedometer reached to 60 as I shifted into fifth gear, the feeling of being watched intensifying with each passing second. I prayed that I would see something, anything ahead of us, an intersection, a house, a freaking out of use payphone, and then my blood turned to ice as a light appeared ahead of us, the exact same one as before with the sign underneath. My eyes flickered to the clock and terror shot through me as I saw it still was frozen at the same time. This isn't good bro, Craig said from the passenger seat. I agreed with him but I didn't say it out loud. I kept my foot to the floor, the speedometer now hitting 80. The turnoff appeared again and what I saw made me want to scream. The woman had gotten closer to the road and she wasn't alone anymore. Behind her I saw others, the outlines of other people, dozens, possibly more. They all stood facing the road watching us fly by and then they disappeared into the rearview mirror. Jesus. I breathed out as the light and sign flashed by yet again. This time the mass of people had gotten even closer to the road. The woman stood in front of them all and for a split second, the headlights illuminated her. Another flash of ice shot through my veins as I saw the river of blood pouring down the front of her nightgown, one that looked to be decades old. What do we do? Craig asked me, his voice steady, yet filled with fear the same that I felt. I just shook my head. I don't know, man, was all that I could say. The streetlight began to appear again when I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket, 
causing me to nearly slam on the brakes in surprise. I fumbled in my pocket for it, seeing Craig look over at me. I texted Vanessa when we stopped. I told her to reply back in a few minutes. Now I think I'm going to tell her to call the cops or something. He didn't reply, instead turning to look out the windshield at the approaching light. Flicking my eyes from the phone screen to the road and back, I forced myself to not look at the turn off as we zoomed past the light. I didn't want to see how close those ghosts or demons or whatever they were had gotten to the road. I flipped my finger, pushing away the lock screen and tapping on the messenger icon as the light began to appear once more. Vanessa's message automatically opened, and for a moment relief like I had never felt surged through me at the small bit of normalcy that I had in my grasp. I froze. I didn't even look up at the road. I couldn't. My eyes were locked on the single sentence, reading and rereading it. A wave of confusion passed over me, enough that I spoke aloud. The heck? Craig spoke up. What? What did she say? I didn't answer him. My mind was racing at a million miles an hour trying to understand, but it was like I was hitting a mental wall. I tried to think of something else as another thought came to me, but again the same block was coming to me. As it did, a new wave of fear began to rise up in me, one for an entirely new reason than the terrifying loop flying by outside. The speedometer now showed that we were doing 90, and then Craig spoke. Can I ask you a question, man? Ice filled every vein in my body, not at his question, but at his voice. It was different. Gone was the fear and tension that he had had not even a minute ago. Now he just sounded flat. No, not flat. I couldn't tell why, but the way that his tone was, it almost made me feel like he was smiling. Another shiver cascaded up my spine as I finally forced myself to answer, my mouth dry as cotton. What? He answered as we began to fly under the streetlight. Are you scared? For whatever reason, the question made me turn to look at him, just as the light whizzed over us. For a split second, the car's interior became illuminated again, my eyes locked with his. The light flew by. The turnoff appeared again and for a moment, my eyes flicked up to see that the woman was right next to the road, bathed completely in the headlights. I finally caught a glimpse of her face. And then I was screaming, my fingers tearing at the door handle as the car swerved to the right. I saw a tree flying towards the windshield. I didn't think. I just forced the door open and leapt out. The ground rapidly flew up to meet me. Darkness. I woke up in a hospital room, a bandage covering my head and one arm in a sling. My chest felt like it was on fire as well. The first thing that I saw was Vanessa who upon seeing me wake up burst into tears and wrapped her arm around me. A few moments later the doctor came in. He told me that I was a lucky man. Apparently I had gotten away with only a gash in my head requiring staples, severely bruised ribs and a broken arm. Shocking for having dove out of a car at what appeared to be tremendous speed, he said raising an eyebrow. And then he told me the police wanted to speak to me. He showed the men and two officers entered asking me many questions. I told them exactly what had happened well, except for two small details anyways. They appeared to take my account seriously and promised to look into it. And we've had some reports similar to yours, sir. One of them answered tentatively, and then they told me how I had been found. How a father and a son who owned a gas station nearby had been out driving and had come across to first my destroyed Honda, which had wrapped itself around a tree and then some, and then lying unconscious in the grassy ditch. Me. They didn't say who they had been, but I had a fair idea who they had been, at least the son anyways. And that night was three months ago. I've been at home resting and healing this entire time, and it's given me plenty of time to think, plenty of time to process everything. I try not to think about that night, about any of it. I feel like I'll go insane if I do. 
especially after the police told me that they found nobody else at the scene of the wreck, only the passenger door hanging open. But I've had to after receiving an email from an unknown address, one claiming to be the son, the kid that I saw in the gas station that night. He told me things, things that his father told me he had seen for years, that he didn't believe at all, until that night. When he looked out the door at my car, that's when he had frantically called his father. As I type this out, I feel myself beginning to violently shake. Remembering the woman's face, indeed it goes, as it flashed in the headlights. The look of horror plastered there as she frantically waved at me to get my attention. The same look the others must have had, remembering turning to look at Craig as the light flickered over, and seeing the smile on his face. A smile wider than any human beings could possibly be, filled with shark-like teeth as black eyes stared hungrily at me. The same shark-like smile the kid told me he had been flashed as I pulled away. But mostly, I remember the single line of text that Vanessa sent me. What caused me to rack my brain, trying frantically to recall my friendship with the figure sitting opposite me, and horror filling me as I realized that I couldn't think of one single memory. What will keep me from ever taking late night drives again? The three words that will remain burned into my memory forever. Darling, who's Craig? It's officially time to kickstart your holiday shopping, but there's no cause for panic. Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free by scouring the globe for the most remarkable and truly unique gifts for everyone on your list. Whether you're shopping for mom, dad, teenagers, in-laws, or your best friends, Uncommon Goods knows exactly what they want. A few of my favorite gifts that I've found are the 12 Days of Christmas Hot Sauce Calendar. What better way to spice up the holiday season than actual hot sauce? And the Apocalypse Survival Kit. It includes a multi-tool, a compass, a torch, a whistle, and a wire saw. Everything that you need to survive the holiday apocalypse season. Zombies are pretty scary, but Black Friday shoppers are even scarier. And Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or in the US. They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. To get 15% off your next gift, go to UncommonGoods.com slash MrCreeps. That's UncommonGoods.com slash MrCreeps for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary.